to destroy the works of the evil one and the kingdom of darkness with light and to rescue men from the law of sin this is the gospel of christ to proclaim the news unto the poor the gospel of christ spreading the soul-saving message of jesus and now ben bailey this is the gospel of christ in Jeremiah 37, verse 17, a wonderful question is asked. Is there any word from the Lord? We're so glad that you joined us for our study today of answering denominational doctrines. Today we're going to, consider, we're going to be considering the doctrines of Calvinism and that of the Presbyterian religion as well. And so we want to encourage you to locate your Bible have it ready to look together with us in the Word of God to examine if these teachings are true. And friend, we're so happy that you've joined us for our study together today. We want you to know that members of the Lord's Church and congregations of the Churches of Christ are making this program possible. We hope that you'll visit the Lord's Church uh, in your area, whether it be for their Sunday worship or Bible study, maybe on Wednesday as well. Stop by and visit with them. They'd love to talk to you and get to know you better. Maybe sit down and have a study of the scriptures with you. They'd be more than happy to do that. And friend, we also want you to know that at the Gospel of Christ, our main motive is to help people to know God and to go to heaven. That's what we're concerned about. We're concerned about lost souls being saved and living with God forever. We want to help you in your study of the Word of God. Uh, check out our website, thegospelofchrist.com. We've got free material there, all of our material is free. If you'd like to have a copy of today's lesson on DVD or CD, a friend, just go to our website, fill out a media request form, or you can write to us, call us, or email us. All of our lessons are also available for download free, and uh, we'd be happy to help you in your endeavor to know God and His Word better. Friend, as we think about religious doctrines, uh, denominational doctrines of men that have been promoted and pushed throughout the centuries, our consideration today of Calvinism goes way back and Calvinism uh, gets into and has roots in many uh, religious groups today. And so we want to consider the doctrines of John Calvin, Calvinism, and the Presbyterian religious group today. Let me tell you first of all a little bit of, of history about the Presbyterian religion and John Calvin as well. Uh, the Presbyterian movement started somewhere in the 1535 to 1560 range. Uh, it began in Germany under the thinking of John Calvin, who you've named, you've probably heard. That movement later went on to Switzerland where it was made the state religion even under a man by the name of John Knox. The official headquarters of the Presbyterian Church in the USA is Louisville, Kentucky. Uh, some would say the PCA is in Atlanta, Georgia. Originally, though, it was in Westminster, London, England. And so it goes back many centuries to that. This movement, of course, was founded upon the doctrine of John Calvin in 1533, later popularized by the teaching of John Knox in 1560. Now, as to their authority, as we think about the authority of the Presbyterian Church, uh, an appeal is made to Scripture as authority. However, one must also have the Westminster uh, uh, Confession of Faith and Catechism to be a true Presbyterian. And so as you think about the origin and roots of this, this new denomination, as it were, the Presbyterian movement, kind of began and had its roots in the revolt against Catholicism. As you know, Martin Luther, a German priest, nailed his 95 grievances or theses uh, to the door of the Catholic Church in Germany. Later, John Calvin and John Knox would take some of that teaching, take it over to Switzerland and Holland and further develop that even in England. And so it had its roots in an uprising against the false doctrine of Calvinism or the Catholic Church. But oftentimes it went to extremes as well. Maybe to help us better understand 
how some of this doctrine of Calvinism is definitely contrary to the teaching of Scripture, we might examine the five major tenets of Calvinism. This is often known as the TULIP, an acrostic form, total depravity, unconditional election, limited atonement, irresistible grace, and perseverance of the saints would be that which makes the TULIP. And we're going to consider the teachings of each of these for just a moment today. Let's begin by thinking about the first, and these kind of follow in a, if we buy into the first, they kind of follow into a systematic, logical way of thinking uh, that way. And so the first is total depravity. Now you say, what in the world does that mean? Well, here's what total depravity, here's how total depravity uh, is defined. It is stated as people in their natural, unregenerate state do not have the ability to turn to God. Rather, it is the grace and will of God through the Spirit that causes men who are dead in sin to be reborn with the Word of God. And so basically the idea is that when Adam and Eve sinned, because of their sin, that the, the, the consequences and the death of sin and the unregenerate state was passed on to every person who's ever been born and thus we are born dead in sin and if we die in that state destined to hell. Well, friend, is it the case that man is born dead in sin and that man is born unregenerate and if he stays in that state that he will die that way? Is it the case, here's what we're asking, is it the case that somehow Sin, the sin of Adam is passed on to me and you before we were even able to comprehend it and we were born dead in sin as babies? Is that really the teaching of Scripture? Friend, let me show you some Scriptures, some very clear Scriptures which clearly show this is false doctrine. It is not the case. It is false doctrine that we are born totally depraved and born lost because of what Adam and Eve did. Open your Old Testament to Ezekiel chapter 18. And I want you to see what's going on in this context because it's rather important to understand how this shows total depravity is not true. Here's what's happening. In Ezekiel chapter 18, the people had a, a statement as it were they said in Ezekiel 18 verse 2, the fathers have eaten sour grapes and the children's teeth are set on edge. God says don't use that proverb anymore. Basically what they're saying is, dad ate something sour and I can taste it in my mouth. God said no, no, we're not going to say that anymore. Well, Why is that? Because that's not true. You don't inherit, you do not taste sour in your mouth because your dad ate something sour. Basically what others did, we reap the consequence. That's not true, God said. And friend, I want you to listen to Ezekiel chapter 18, verse number 20. The soul who sins shall die. Now watch this. The son shall not bear the guilt of the father, nor the father bear the guilt of the son. The righteousness of the righteous shall be upon himself, and the wickedness of the wicked shall be upon himself. God said, you're not bearing the guilt of somebody else's sin. We are not bearing the guilt of Adam and Eve's sin. I'm not bearing the guilt of my mom and dad's sin, whatever that may have been. Righteous people can be righteous. Wicked people will be wicked, but we get a clean slate and a fresh start when we come into this world. How do I know that? Again, that's exactly what the Scripture says. Turn over to Ezekiel 28, and I want to show you an evil man who, although he was evil when he was spoken to, had a clean slate from the beginning. Look in Ezekiel 28, and I want you to notice what God says about the king of Tyre. God says to Ezekiel, take up this prophecy and say to the king of Tyre, thus says the Lord of God. And so in the region of Tyre, God is speaking to the king of that area. Now what did God say to this man? Look in verse 15. I want you to listen real carefully to this now. God says, you were perfect in all your ways. Watch this from the day you were created until iniquity was found in you. Although the king of Tyre had done evil, although he was not right in the sight of God when God wrote to him, God created him perfect 
upright in all his ways until sin was found in him. Friend, it is, listen carefully. It is false doctrine, it is not true, and it is not right that we come into this world stained with the sin and the guilt of Adam and Eve. Oh, there's no doubt they sinned. There's no doubt they opened the door to death and to sin. But every one of us has actually, I, I'm, I'm not going to suffer the consequences of sin and death because of Adam. I suffer the consequences of sin and death because I've sinned. Not because they're sin, because of my personal sin. Now let me show you that. Look at Romans chapter 5, and I want you to see what the Scripture actually says. Look in Romans 5. And I want you to notice what the Word of God says in verse number 12. This is so telling as it relates to total depravity. Therefore, just as through one man sin entered the world. They opened the door, sin became a possibility. Now listen to this. And death through sin, and death spread to all men because Adam sinned. Uh-uh. That isn't what it says. Death spread to all men. Why? Because all sinned. I do not bear the guilt, nor do I bear the consequences of Adam's sin, no more than the people of Israel tasted sour in their mouth because their mom and dad ate something sour. We each are given a clean slate. We each can start out with that, uh, that blank slate. And while it is the case that we all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, we don't come back. Listen, babies do not come into this world totally depraved. God made man upright, Ecclesiastes chapter 7 and Ecclesiastes chapter 9, and yet they sought out many schemes against him. Secondly, as we think about that acrostic tulip of Calvinism, where it starts with total depravity, we then move into the idea of unconditional election. The Westminster Confession of Faith in chapter 3, pages 1 through 7, says this about uh, unconditional election or otherwise known as predestination. By the decree of God for the manifestation of His glory, listen now, some men and angels are predestined to life and others predestined or foreordained to everlasting death. These angels and men thus predestined and foreordained are, per, listen now, are particularly and unchangeably designed. And their number is so certain and definite that it cannot be either increased or decreased. Now friend, let me break that down and put it to you this way. What's that saying in real simple terms? Ahead of time, God chose some men and some angels to go to heaven and some men and some angels to go to heaven. That number is so set that even if you wanted to, you couldn't change it. If you're in the group, just imagine you've got an auditorium and that auditorium has two long sections of pews running through it. Everybody on the left side, good news for you. God chose you to go to heaven. All of you on the right, I'm sorry, and even if you want to do something about it, you can't. You're going to hell. Now, friend, I want you to just think, God, ahead of time, chose some men and some angels to be predestined to eternal life, some men and some angels predestined to eternal death, and there is absolutely nothing you can do it. You can't take one person away from the saved. You can't take one person away from the lost. It's just, it, it can't be done. Well, friend, does the Bible teach the idea of unconditional election or predestination. Friend, you talk about a discouraging doctrine. What if I'm in the group on the right, per se, that is predestined to eternal death? Sorry, that's just the way it is. Nothing you can do about it. My friend, if you read your Bible much, you know that the idea of unconditional election and predestination is just not taught. Man does have a choice. The Bible teaches man can choose right, man can amend his ways, and man can get right with God. He is not unconditionally elected and he is not predestined in the sense that he is going to go to heaven or hell and there's nothing he can do about it. God predestined the church to be saved and God says let whoever will get in the church. There's a predestined group, that's the church, but anybody can get in that. Alright, here are some scriptures that teach man's got a choice. Listen now, and if man's got a choice, God didn't decide that ahead of time and predestination falls flat on its face. 
the Bible says, Joshua speaking in Joshua 24, 15, to the people of Israel, choose for yourselves this day whom you will serve. Wait a minute. What do you mean choose? I'm not predestined to either be right or wrong. No. Choose for yourselves this day whom you will serve. Listen to Acts chapter 10. New Testament records for us in Acts chapter 10, verses 34 and 35, that, that anybody who wants to can change their way and get right with God and that God has not selected some to be saved and some to be lost. Listen to Acts 10, verse 34 and 35. Then Peter opened his mouth to Cornelius and his household and said, In truth I perceive God shows no partiality in every nation. Whoever fears Him and works righteousness is accepted by Him. Friend, if there's a passage that clearly shows unconditional election and predestination is not true, this is it. Peter says, let me tell you the truth on the matter. God shows no partiality. Well, friend, just stop right there for just a moment, okay? If God's not partial and predestination says everybody on the left side saved, everybody on the right, and I know that's just a simplified way of thinking about it, but if God has selected this group to be saved and this group to be lost, a friend, God was partial. Why wasn't I put in the saved group? And why was somebody I love put in the lost group? God is partial if predestination is true. But then listen further to Acts 10 verse 35. Peter says, in every nation, those who fear God and work righteousness can be accepted by Him. Again, if unconditional election and predestination is true, that verse really doesn't make a lot of sense because you've already been predestined and as you follow Calvinism through, God's going to in some ways help you with that and persevere and all that. So in every nation, men can choose to obey God or not to obey God. It's not the idea that we can't be saved and that we've been elected to be lost and there's nothing we can do about it. Galatians 2 verse 6 says it this way, God is no respecter of persons. What's that mean? God doesn't value me any higher than you or you any higher than me. God loves all of us. And yet, if God chose these to be saved and these to be lost, He did respect some people more than others. Friend, I want you to think about what that says about God. Have you really thought through to what this says, this doctrine says about the mind of God? Why did God, if unconditional election and predestination is true, why did God create some people to be predestined to be lost in eternity and suffer in hell? Friend, they didn't even have a choice in the matter. And again, that's not in line with the teaching of God or the Bible, but this doctrine naturally puts God in a very dismal dark light like many of uh, the archaic idols and gods under the Egyptians and the Canaanites in the Old Testament. And then we move on to the idea of limited atonement. Naturally following unconditional election, you would then have to say logically that God's atonement is also limited. If everybody's not going to be saved, then that atonement is not for everybody. It's limited. John Calvin taught that atonement was sufficient for all, but not efficient. Uh, it was not efficient for all. It was sufficient for all, but only efficient for the elect. That is, those God chose to save. Jesus died for all men, but His death in reality will only be able to save a few. And again, these ideas are just clearly out of line with the teaching of the Scripture. The Bible teaches Jesus' atonement is both sufficient and it is both efficient. For everybody. That is, it's, it's able to save and everybody can be saved if they so choose to do so. 1 Timothy 2 4, listen to this now. God wants all men to be saved and come to a knowledge of the truth. Now, friend, we understand man's got a choice in that, but if I take limited atonement to its logical end and that uh, the, the sacrifice of Christ is going to be limited, it can only be limited to the elect that God chose to be saved then, friend, God wants something that He cannot have because He created predestination and it's opposed to what He actually wants. Do you see the logical contradiction with the Scriptures and that idea? Uh, think a little further about this. 2 Peter 3, 9. The Lord's not slow concerning His promises, as some men count slowness, but He's long-suffering toward us, not willing that any should perish, but that all 
should come to repentance. Again, God wants all to be saved, and yet He wants all to come to repentance, and yet predestination says He actually created people to be lost and nothing can be done about it. Does God want something He cannot have? Again, those ideas are just contradictory with the teaching of Scripture. And so all throughout the Bible, we see that the doctrine of limited atonement is not true. Hebrews 2 verse 9, Jesus, his, He's able to save to the uttermost all those who come to God through Him. Listen to this, Hebrews 2 9, Jesus tasted death for every man. Now if Calvinism is true, we need to amend Hebrews 2 9 to say, Jesus tasted death for the elect. That's not what the Bible says. Jesus tasted death for all men. Titus 2 verse 11 says, For the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to the elect. No, no. Has appeared to all men. Friend, God wants the sacrifice of Jesus is both efficient and effective and able to save all. Men have a choice to make. It's not as though the atonement has been limited. That was never God's plan. Jesus died for everybody. And so the atonement is not limited. The only limit is man's choice whether he will obey God or not. But if he chooses, he can become a child of God and be saved. Then naturally, if we are going to take the logical doctrine of Calvinism, we're born lost as a baby. Uh, we, some of us are elected to be saved. Some of us are elected to be lost. There's nothing you can do about that. Christ's atonement only applies for the elect. A friend, naturally following that would be the idea of irresistible grace. Irresistible grace, according to the Westminster Confession of Faith, says this. This effectual call is of God, free and special grace alone, not from anything at all foreseen in man, who is altogether, listen now, who is altogether passive therein, until being quickened and renewed by the Holy Spirit, he is thereby enabled to answer this call and to embrace the grace offered and conveyed in it. Basically saying, if you're part of the elect, the Holy Spirit will let you know somehow you'll be quickened and made alive by the Holy Spirit and you will accept this calling and obey the gospel. Uh, again, you just kind of put it in neutral. God's going to eventually take over. God's going to eventually show you that you will receive His grace and you will one day know you're part of the elect. Now friend, I want you to think about all the people who might have bought into that idea and uh, never waited on that and never got it. And because they bought into that idea, never made the choice to obey the gospel. Well, the Holy Spirit's eventually going to, I'm going to be the elect one day and the Holy Spirit's eventually going to tell me I'm going to be quick and made alive. And they kept waiting and kept waiting and kept waiting and it never happened. Friend, if they'd only been taught... They had a choice to make. Is it the idea, does the Bible teach that God is going to call me if I'm a part of the elect and the Holy Spirit's going to do something and that I cannot resist? Even if I want to, I cannot resist the grace of God. Again, that's just not what the Scripture teaches as it relates to these ideas. Titus 2 verse 11, The grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men. His grace is not just to the elect who cannot resist it. God's grace has appeared to all men. According to the teaching of the Scripture, God calls all men. Let whosoever will come. Revelation 22, 17. If Calvinism is correct, God's going to go to them and the elect are going to be quickened by the Holy Spirit. And yet the Bible says in Revelation 2, 22, 17, it's not as though God's going to overtake you. God says... Let whosoever will come. Now, friend, what did Jesus say about this idea? In Matthew eleven twenty eight, 28, Jesus said, Come unto me, all ye who are labor and are heavy laden, and I'll give you rest. My yoke is easy, my burden's light, you'll find rest for your souls. It is not the case that Christ said, I'm going to send the Holy Spirit, you're not going to resist His grace, one day you're going to be quickened and made alive. No, Jesus said, you come to me. God said, let whosoever will. Come. The Bible makes the call for all men to come. Friend, I want you to stop and think about for just a moment irresistible grace and how it devalues evangelism. If God is going to show to the elect that they're the elect, and if one day the Holy Spirit's going to do something and they can't resist God's grace, why evangelize? Why teach somebody about the gospel? Holy Spirit's going to do that. They're not going to resist it no matter what. God's going to somehow show them or take over as it were. 
And so the idea of irresistible grace, although it follows logically with these false doctrines, is just not true according to the Bible. Then let's deal with that last step, last leg in the tulip of Calvinism, that is the perseverance of the saints or once saved, always saved. It says this, in the Westminster Confession of Faith, they say, they whom God has accepted in His beloved, effectually called, sanctified by the Spirit, can neither totally nor finally fall away from the taste of grace, but shall certainly persevere therein to the end and be eternally saved. One Baptist preacher said it this way in Louisville, Kentucky. He made the statement, if I killed my wife and mother, debauched a thousand women, I couldn't go to hell. In fact, I couldn't go to hell even if I wanted to. Now, that's, that's taking it to its logical end. Most probably, probably wouldn't say that, but that's logical. Friend, is it the case that if I'm called by God, if I have that irresistible grace, that I can never be, set, be lost? Well, friend, think about all the religious groups that buy into once saved, always saved, and yet in the language that many false teachers use, that you can't fall from grace, God says the exact opposite. Let me show you a couple of passages. Look in your Bible. I want you to see that once saved, always saved is just not true. In fact, the idea that you can't fall from grace is clearly taught against in the Scripture. Look in Galatians chapter 5, verse number 4. Paul says, To Christians who are trying to go back and keep the law, you have become estranged from Christ. You who attempt to be justified by law, you have fallen from grace. Now, friend, let's think about it logically. Calvinism says you can't fall from grace, and yet we just read in the Bible, writing to Christians, Paul said, you have fallen from grace. To Simon the sorcerer in Acts chapter 8, verses 20 through 22, Peter said to Simon who had sinned, your money perish with you. What? Simon, who was converted by an inspired apostle, who was baptized for the remission of his sins, is told after he became a Christian, your money's going to perish with you. And so, friend, we invite you today to consider the ideas of Calvinism. Are they from God or are they from men? Check in your Bible, see for yourself, and then let's obey the gospel of Christ. You may have just joined our program and are wondering, what is the gospel of Christ? The gospel of Christ is an evangelistic work of the churches of Christ that reaches the whole world with the gospel through TV, radio, and internet. Our motto is to take the whole gospel to the whole world. We believe in having a book, chapter, and verse for everything we say and do. And unlike many religious groups today, we're concerned about lost souls, not your wife. This is the Gospel of Christ. We encourage you to visit thegospelofchrist.com for a host of Bible study material, as well as audio and video copies of our lessons. If you would like to have a copy of today's lesson, please visit our website and fill out a media request form. Or you can email us at mail at thegospelofchrist.com. Call us toll free at 1-855-458-3905. Or write to us at P.O. Box 788, McMinnville, Tennessee, 37111. This is the Gospel of Christ.